<clears throat> so we all know what it's like to play games with other people, but did you know that more and more games every year give you the opportunity to play them by yourself? And we're not just talking solitaire here. We're talking multiplayer games with a solo mode, as well as games that are designed to be played by only one person. They can be small games with boxes that can hide under a dinner roll to epic sprawling experiences that you lay out on your table and leave out until Christmas. So what does it mean to play alone? And what lessons can we learn from the experience of playing alone? This week, we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Liz Davidson from the Beyond Solitaire podcast to discuss these questions and more on Board Game Faith, the bi-weekly podcast exploring the intersection of spirituality, religion, and board games. Hello and welcome everybody to episode 40. This is episode 40. Kevin, Crazy. of the Crazy. Board Game Faith Podcast. My name is Daniel Hilty. My name is Kevin Taylor, and our special guest is... Go Hi, ahead. I'm Liz Davidson. Yay! Liz, <laughs> welcome! We are so glad to have you here. Thank you so much for making time to hang out with us today. Yeah, absolutely. You'll come to regret it. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've, well, we've this... enjoyed it so far. <laughs> yep. yep. Uh, I did a little looking up on your background, so correct me, but this is what I pulled from the internet. You have a PhD from Yale Divinity School in no, ancient... No, not Divinity School. No, uh, uh, Graduate no. School of Arts and Sciences. Graduate I know this school, student. pardon me. See, it's already wrong. <laughs> yeah, uh, Graduate School of Arts and school. Sciences of Yale University. That's probably where I got. I, I just made an <laughs> assumption there. In ancient Christianity in 2014. Wow. What was your dissertation on? I wrote about the sermons of Shenouda Atripa. He was a Coptic speaking and writing monk from the fourth and fifth centuries AD, who was leader of a monastic federation in Upper Egypt during that time. He's also the most prolific native Coptic author that we have extant. So most of the Coptic text is the last phase of the Egyptian language. So think like whatever hieroglyphs turned into, but like written with Greek letters and like a few extra letters to communicate sounds that aren't in Greek. Um, uh, but then <laughs> uh, most of the things that are in Coptic that we have are translations from Greek. So lots of Bible translations, lots of like saints lives, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but Shenouda was writing sermons and letters and just his own thoughts in Coptic. And he has the largest body um, hmm. of Coptic that's native Coptic that we have. Wow. Is, and his name is Shenouda? Shenouda. Uh, S-H-E-N-O-U-T-E. Shenouda of Atripa. That's an awesome... <laughs> Awesome story. Thank you. Isn't there still... I wonder what his rap name was because it already sounds think... like a rap name. Isn't there still like one. a Coptic, a Coptic Christian church in Egypt? There is, and they yeah, have yeah. had a pope named Shenouda in the past while, but um, they also have other like monk names from the Egyptian tradition are very common. Um, okay, in, among Coptic. Popes. And why did you write on Shenouda? What interested um, honestly, you? Honestly, I fell in love with him in college when I read his uh, Saint's Life, his hagiography. And uh, I got to the, I'd been reading the Saints of the Desert Fathers and all that kind of stuff. They're fun. Uh, but there's a, there's a scene in his uh, little Saint's life where Shenouda senses that somebody is possessed by a demon. So he picks up like a wooden gong and just beats it out of the guy. <laughs> and it just made me laugh so hard. Like he's basically a raging a-hole who's also extremely interesting. Okay. So, um, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, he's, he offers just a really interesting insight into you know, Egyptian monastic life. Um, you know, I didn't know I was interested in monks, but I went back and looked at things that I was reading like before I went to grad school and I'd underline like everything about monasticism. I find them very interesting. I find their commitment mm -hmm. and their dedication very interesting. And alternative and so lifestyle I really enjoy communities. Studying monks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Wow. And you have taught Latin, Greek, English, and math, That's which is amazing. So you've got quite a background. Yeah. <laughs> And you currently are in Atlanta, Georgia, with the website, YouTube channel, and podcast, Beyond Solitaire. So, that is accurate. So, uh, well, Liz, you have especially developed an, a niche, a niche uh, area of expertise about solo board gaming. So talk to us a little bit about that, how you got into it, and, and how it's different um, from regular board gaming. 
You know, I would say it's probably actually not that different, uh, especially not anymore. Um, solo gaming got hot during the COVID years, but let me just say, I was, I'm a hipster. I was, I was, I knew about it before it was cool. <laughs> uh, uh, basically the very short story of this, uh, that I've told elsewhere is that I was a magic, the gathering addict, but it was too much money. So I decided right. to try to get deck construction, um, but not have to chase cards. And so I tried the Lord of the Rings living card game. I realized that you could play that on your own. So I started building my own decks and just playing it. And then I realized that other people were also playing board games by themselves and I got hooked. And nice. so now here we nice. are like years later, um, I'm still doing it <laughs> and uh, I really enjoy it. I, I've never played magic. Can you play magic by, I mean, is it possible to even like vary the rules to play magic by oneself or, or, or not? I would say, I mean, I'm sure that there's somebody who's made it possible, but the joy of magic is making a deck and then competing against a deck that somebody else made. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, okay. you know, okay. being able to so compete against like an automated opponent made it easier for me to do the deck construction in the living card game. Yeah. Um, and just how do does the living card game do it? Is it a timer or a, how does it? It's a mix. There's like a timer. Up. There's enemy cards that come out. You have to make progress in your goals. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, basically the, the AI deck operates differently from the way you play. And so mm -hmm. it's got a system that you're trying to fight against using the weapons at your command. Uh, but it's kind of got its own system for fighting you. So you don't have to like, use other player cards there's actually a set enemy that all the players are fighting against mm -hmm. one of the things one of the things that struck me about solo board gaming which i enjoy as well it's almost got a puzzle feel to it it's almost like doing the crossword puzzle or doing something like that because you can stop and start and because you're not facing a physical opponent that might have tells or or right or social cues it's kind of a you know, it's like a piece of paper. It's an automated something. Does that make sense? It does. I would say the puzzle aspect of solo gaming is part of the appeal, but there mm -hmm. are a lot of different kinds of solo gamers. And so if you want, so in some ways I would say solo gaming can also be akin to writing a novel. If you're playing a game that has really good narrative structure, right. then, you know, instead it's more like you're being immersed in a story, but you can make all the choices in this choose your own adventure without having to answer to anybody else, which I right. sometimes appreciate because I am selfish I and I want to game the way I want and I want to play what I want. Um. I know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, I, th I, know yeah, exactly I think related mean. to that, that's one of the things I always enjoy about solo gaming is is the fact that I guess it's kind of maybe a hybrid of what you're both saying, but um, I can take as much time as I want to to think about my next move, right? And it and like no, and I'm not gonna. I don't feel like this, like I'm uh, I'm like imposing on the time of the person around the on the other side of the table from me, or and 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 um, yeah, yeah. I have to say um, that I, I first. I was saying this before our show first started recording Liz, but I first found out about you with your solo board game reviews. I play a fair amount of solo board games and, um, and I am always um, uh, really happy when I discover that a solo board game that I'm thinking about purchasing um, has a review by you on, on YouTube, because I, I always really appreciate your reviews and I, they're always very thoughtful and thorough. And, and I figure I have found that if you like them, I usually tend to like them too. And if you have concerns, I usually have some concerns too. So I, anyway, I, I recommend Liz's uh, reviews if you haven't checked them out. They're, they're, they've been really helpful for me. So, yeah. Hey, I appreciate that. I, mean, I think so, a lot, I mean, y'all are making a podcast, you know. Um, you know, when you make things and you put them out on the internet, you want people to, you want to imagine people are listening and interacting and that what you're doing is useful to somebody. And yeah. so it's really nice to like get some sort of feedback that that is don't. the case. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. No, well, it's definitely, you, you are, your videos are my, my go-to resource for, for solo board game reviews. So, um, mm -hmm. so what have, what has playing a solo games taught you over the years? Have you kind of learned some lessons from playing solo games about yourself, about life, about gaming? Yeah. I mean, I would say, so a lot of people, I think, play board games specifically to be social with other people. And I, I do do that. I, you know, I'm going to game night tomorrow night. Tomorrow's my game night. I do have friends, believe it or not, uh, that I do game with. <laughs> but um, one thing I really like about solo gaming is that in a lot of ways, I can tell if I really, really like a game for itself because I want to play it when I'm alone. 
So I think mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, it's the true test of whether mm. a game is for me, because if I can maintain the attention span while I'm on my own uh, and I don't need the company of others to keep me focused, then I feel pretty convinced that I like the game. Uh, mm. I also really like very solitary experiences. Uh, part of it is that I do really enjoy getting my alone time. Um, I think it's really important. I don't know if you're just scratching the background. That is my cat. Uh, I think your cat is making popcorn, actually. <laughs> Sounds like a microwave. Pop He's like a little machine. demon cat. I love him so much. Um, but, <laughs> but um, you know, I, I find also that one of the reasons I started solo gaming too is that, you know, I got this living card game and I thought maybe I'll get somebody else to play it with me. Uh, but that turned out to be harder than I anticipated. So I thought, well, you know what? I'll play it by myself. And I feel like that is an attitude that I've developed over the course of my life from wanting to do things and also realizing that I can't wait for other people to kind of give me permission to do the things mm. that I want to do. Yeah, so, that's good. I also, I go to the movies by myself. Um, if I'm traveling, you know, usually my boyfriend likes to go with me these days, but before he was in my life, like I absolutely went to the movies by myself. Um, if I'm out alone for the day, I will 100%. If I want to eat in a restaurant by myself, I will absolutely do that. Um, <laughs> I have no shame yeah. about it whatsoever. Um, you know, uh, I, I tell the story sometimes. I've told the story in the context of solo gaming before. Um, the first time I ever went abroad, I got like a scholarship to go to the Goethe Institute in Berlin for two months. And everybody wow. talked about like, oh, you know, let's go to Paris one weekend. And we all agreed and everybody else chickened out. And I was like, you know what? Screw that. I'm going to go to Paris. And I went by myself. I had a grand old time. And then I came back and because I didn't, I didn't know that a future summer contained Paris. You know, I didn't, I didn't know that was going to happen for me. So, you know, yeah. I went while I could. And, you know, I went to the, I, then after that, I started going to the museums I wanted to go to, whether or not anybody else wanted to go. Um, I feel like gaming is in that same vein of like, if you want to play something and you really want to play it, then just do it. Nobody yeah. can stop you if it's a solitary experience. Mm-hmm. And I also think that as a teacher, this, this I think about this a lot. My students concern me a little bit because the kids are generally all right. So we, we bemoan the youth and all that. But, you know, high schoolers are, I'm happy to tell you, generally intelligent and charming and funny. And they're everything that you kind of hope the next generation is going to be. They're generally mm-hmm. pretty good mm-hmm. to each other, at least in front of me. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, you know, all the, all the good things are, are generally there. But what concerns me is that they have a hard time being alone. Mm. They really, really want interaction constantly. And social media does not help. Um, you know, they're up texting each other until really late. They are constantly looking for stimulation that somebody else has kind of created from the outside. Uh, they, they have a really hard time with quiet. And I find that concerning just because as a philosophical theme, like I believe that you should be able to enjoy your own company and that it's a sign of security and like okayness with yourself and who you are that you are able to do so. Right. And so... I, I really enjoy solo gaming because I actually, you know, I'm, I'm not perfect by any stretch, right? But I do genuinely like myself and I enjoy like being in my own head for periods of time because I'm, you know, I'm comfortable with who I've turned out to be. Like that's still evolving. Everybody's evolving all the time, but mm-hmm. I would like for more people to feel that way. Hmm. I love that sense yeah. of, um, of um, yeah, growing in both your comfort of with being with, with yourself and liking yourself and not needing to rely on other people and, and not feel like you have to have someone's permission to do really anything. It, it all, it also strikes me as you're talking, you know, you, so we began the conversation where you're talking about this, this, uh, this Coptic monk that you love so much, you know, that, that you really resonated with. And, you know, you often think about kind of the monastic life as one kind of, of, of one of kind of solitude and silence and, and, and enjoy, I mean, being able to be by oneself. And then it's cool to kind of hear some similar things kind of around solo gaming as well. And I, I don't know if I feel like any kind of uh, kindred spirits in that or not, but that's, that's cool. I like, it's almost like, it almost sounds like a, like a, like a monastic sort of practice in the best way right in the in the good in the good way in i don't know yeah oh i think there's there is a lot to be learned from monks and even for me so uh for those of you out there who are listening just fyi i am a straight up atheist um I, technically i would be what you would call a weak atheist i do not like feel comfortable asserting for sure that there's nothing out there but i have not seen anything to indicate it and i just live my life as if there isn't so <laughs> hmm. uh, yeah but um but that doesn't mean right that i don't see value in like people seeing how best to live their lives and like really putting a lot of thought into that yeah and yeah. uh you know i think that 
what makes me happy to, you know, as I learn about monastic practice is always, you know, actually there's a monastic story about this um, because there's lots of stories. Yeah. One of my favorites is um, there's like a novice monk and his teacher tells him, okay, so um, monks should be like the dead. And he's like, what do you mean? And so he says, okay, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to the cemetery and I want you to praise the dead all day and tell them how wonderful they are and just really blow some smoke and then come back and report to me. And so being very literalist, this novice monk goes to the cemetery, you know, because, oh, you're so wonderful, great dead. You're, you're fantastic. And he comes back and the guy's like, okay, um, so tomorrow I want you to go out and I want you to insult the dead, throw rocks, don't pee on things. Maybe he told him to, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But like, you know, yell insults at the dead. And so he goes and he does that all day. F you, you're so dumb, eh, dead people that. And he goes back and his teacher's like, okay, so when you praise the dead, what happened? And he's like, nothing. And he's like, okay, so when you insulted the dead, what happened? Ooh. Nothing. He's like, okay, well, that's what a monk should be like. Impervious to praise or insult. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that is pretty good. That is pretty good. I like that. I like that. I wonder D if... There seems like there's so much anxiety among kids today, and I know that makes me sound old. And there's, there's, the Victorian era was an anxious age too, so maybe it's just modern living, or maybe we just talk about it more. I don't know. But I wonder if that inability to be by yourself and in your own head and to not have outside stimulation, I wonder if that is somehow connected to that anxious, anxious state of, you know, I don't know. What do you think? I think that it's probably common to the human condition. People are always anxious, I think, about how others perceive mm -hmm. them. It's it's only natural, right? If you think about the kind of species we are and how it is important for us to have social relationships, you know, even if you like to be alone, you do sure. kind of need other people to survive. And, you know, you're part of a community, even if you're, you know, the guy on a pillar outside the community where they can see you and they know you're there, like you're still part of the community. <laughs> yeah, they bring you uh, through, You want right? people to know so, you're there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that we all want to be seen and we want to be heard, even if we act like we don't. And I actually, I think that it's, people have always felt anxious, right? About, am I doing what I'm supposed to do with my life? And am I spending my time the way that I should? And mm -hmm. am I, you know, being a sort of person who is worthy of praise from other people? And do other people see me as that? And I think that in a way, what we just do now is see more of it. And I think we're more raw about it because we have the internet. I think the internet reveals yeah. more, especially as like revealing a lot of yourself online, um, you know, becomes more common. I think that we just see a lot more people's raw anxieties just laid out as entertainment for others. Um, right. And I don't, I mean, obviously I put things on the internet because I want people to engage with me, but I'm also a little careful about what I put out there because I do feel reticent about putting out too much about your personal self. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some yeah. things are for you. Like Yeah, yeah. Some level of yeah. vulnerability is 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 helpful and important in life, but the internet can uh can really uh uh take that to an unhealthy level or to can, can really open yourself up to all sorts of hurt from all sorts of angles. <laughs> that, that Also, you really... I will never confess how many monasteries I've destroyed in the course of playing Mage Knight. Never. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mage Knight. That's great. That's, so great. That's great. So great. Yeah. That's great. That's great. <laughs> Have you ever encountered uh, a story of a monk playing a game? Ooh. Um, That's a good one. There are lots of encounters with reading. Less games, uh, at least in earlier texts there's a lot more kind of self-seriousness however i do i don't remember the source is killing me but i'm pretty sure that kids used to play as monks expelling demons from other kids which that's is hilarious. great that's <laughs> great that's great that's great my my little exorcism right yeah then the... yes exactly <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness that's well, great. Thinking That's about great. historical games, and I'm I'm guessing you're familiar with the Nicaea game. Is that right? Because you're a fan yeah. of of Amabel's of, game. Yeah, Amabel's I think I saw work. you had yeah. an episode about it. Yeah, actually, I, I interviewed yeah. her about it, and we had a real <laughs> blast having a good laugh about it. <laughs> so, what are your thoughts of that? I've played it, and it's a wonderful game, and it's a wonderful teaching moment, and really, it's got a lot to say. So, what what are your thoughts about it? This is Ooh, okay, yeah, a historical so, game called Nicaea, about the Council of Nicaea. 
Amabel is such an interesting person. I really respect how much of herself she's willing to put into her games, even games that are about history. So I think that the game is good if you're prepared for the experience that you're going to get out of it, but it may not be good if you want like pure historical instruction about Nicaea. So Nicaea is interesting because Amabel presents it as such an overly political thing. Like the church fathers that you're engaging with are not necessarily committed to one side or the other. They're trying to make sure that their policy, that they're on the right side, basically going forward. And they're a little bit Me meaning little the winning in that side. respect. Yeah. It's yeah. definitely, you know, and I think that there's a lot of truth to that, to be honest, like looking at the history of churches and church leaders and political politics and religion mixing. Um, you know, there's always there's always gonna be problems as long as that happens. And it always has happened. Um at the same time, you know, Emma Bell did not present, I mean, these, the, the fact is that the beliefs that they argued about at the Council of Nicaea are also sincerely held uh, mm -hmm. in, in many ways. And so I think that the game doesn't account for that aspect. Like, I think that some of these people really thought it mattered, um, like what the relationship physically of the son to the father would be. And that, you know, like, is it a kinder egg? Is it a latte? Like, you know, mm -hmm. is, do we have like a human shell with like a little God toy inside? Do we have like these natures that mix and they can't be like unmixed? You know, <laughs> I mean, um, you know, is Jesus totally separate from God in some way, but like God like elevated him? Like, I don't know. And so I think that for some people, those arguments really matter, right? It's why in another little while you get these arguments about whether you can call Mary the mother of God or not, because does she actually bear a divinity uh, in her body, or does she pop out a human that like becomes a god, or like is touched by God? Like, mm -mm. you know, again, this is a mess, right? But mm -hmm. people cared enough about this to have riots in the street, kill each other, um, you know, write about it forever. Clearly, this really mattered to somebody in a way that I personally don't have a dog in this fight, <laughs> but you know, I find it really interesting. I, I really believe that people sincerely did. And so Nicaea is interesting because I think it presents the political aspect very well. And I do believe that that is how Amabel, somebody who's experienced religious trauma, um, understands church history. Mm -hmm. And that's what she sees when she sees the church. Um, but I don't think that that's how they saw themselves. And I don't think that that was what was happening inside of them emotionally at the time it, mm. entirely. Mm. Although when Emperor Constantine tells you to get it together and come up with something, you're going to do it. So right. there's that too. Right. So I a couple of follow-up questions that just, one just you both know more about church history than i do i could give a definition but i think yours would be better what's a nutshell um definition of the council that i see for those for listeners who may not be familiar with it and then secondly i just interested just in general how you feel like your your background as a historian informs your approach to history games in general yeah so basically the council of nicaea is the big battle like cue pokemon music um, <laughs> about whether um we were going to go with sort of like a trinitarian idea or an arian understanding of of christianity of godhead so arianism Ari arius was a, a very popular pastor in egypt actually uh, i like studying my egyptian monks for a number of reasons they yeah, have yeah. lots of varying beliefs that are quite fascinating but um arius basically felt that christ was a creation and not actually a divinity that he was as close to God as you can get, but God made him. Um, and then, you know, there's the counter argument that Jesus is God, holy in substance. So that's why you say things like, we believe in one father, you know, one God, the father, the almighty, creator of heaven, and earth. And then we believe in one son, the only begotten God from God, light from light, true God, begotten, not made. Like we say these words, if we go to church, right? I just had to do that for many years. Um, <laughs> uh, I will absolutely be a good sport if dragged into one. Um, but, you know, <laughs> that great. wording is very deliberate. There's yeah. a reason those words mm -hmm. are there. There's a reason that we say the Nicene Creed is from the yeah. Council of Nicaea. So yeah. a bunch of Greek speaking theologian guys got together, argued it out, and now here we are. Yep. In this Thank modern you. day. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Three, 325 in modern day Turkey? Nicaea yeah. was in Turkey? Yeah. Because this was a place, so. Yeah, well, the other thing is kind of fun thinking about the church. Actually, I think about this in historical gaming as well, is that, you know, all the most important ideas in church history are really not from, like, the Latin-speaking Western part of the Roman Empire at all. Um, they're happening in the East. They're huh. happening in Turkey and in Syria and in Egypt. Um, so 
we that is weird. We tend to deprivilege those areas of the world in our games and when we depict the church and when we talk about it, that's actually deeply unfair. Um right. Leo just sends over the tome of Leo and his otherwise real putts, like totally boring and all this. Like <laughs> um so um you know I you know historical gaming is also fascinating to me because we need, and I say this often, so if you've heard me on another podcast, bear with me. But uh, I, when you're doing history, you're telling two stories, right? You're telling what you think happened. And then in your telling of what happened, you're also telling on yourself. There's always like a parallel narrative right. happening. And so when we represent history in games, we're talking about our world and we're talking about their world. Yeah. And you can't actually separate the two. It's actually probably true for y'all. Y'all are both pastors, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. So like, yep. I mean, whenever you interpret a biblical story for someone, there is what the text says, and then the interpretation you get out of it says a lot about you and yep. about your community, or at least oh, the community absolutely. that you're trying to yeah. form. And yeah. so, you know, it's, it, you know, history is the same way. It's an interpretive act and it's a fact-finding mission. And yeah. so, you know, gaming about history, I think is really interesting because it's a way of talking about history that sometimes we don't even see is talking about history because it's not explicit. Like it's not a book. You don't necessarily see the sources, but the world that you're creating for people to play in, the actions you're allowing them to take, the roles you're encouraging them to enter into, they all contribute to a reconstruction of the world as it was that may or may not be accurate, but what you wanted it to be or how you chose to interpret it says a lot about you and a lot about our modern day as well. So I spend a lot of time like looking at games about ancient Rome and like thinking about these things because mm -hmm. I, I like to look at like the reception of ancient Rome in, in the modern day, because yeah. what did we keep and how do we present Romans? And you know, what do we think about them now? Like all these things come out in our games actually in a way that's maybe more raw than in a book. Right. Cause you're getting to experience it as a series of choices and not as a, complete text maybe yeah, yeah yeah and it's also like the aesthetic that people choose and stuff tells you a lot mm -hmm. yeah no i appreciate that and and I, I always like to bring up the fact that whether it's first century palestine or ancient rome we really don't know what it was like for the average person because we don't have any records like that that's impossible to know so it's a real act of the imagination to picture what it was like and whether the texts we have are just highlighting was that what it was like for many people or just certain groups? You know, there are people walking around in, in uh, Bethlehem and they didn't know what the hell was going on with anything else or they didn't even know who the emperor was. Like, we don't really know. And and you, it, it's it, historians don't always like to acknowledge that, but it's it's true. It's there. Or pastors. That we there's less <laughs> we know than we know. I mean, that's that's the truth of it. Hey, but I that. also appreciate yeah. what you said about uh, the Nicaea game because I had a little bit of the same feeling that I appreciate what it said about the politics, and it is true. I mean, it, it, it's there, but it felt a little not exactly mean, but it just pushed it really hard. And I did ask a church historian friend who commented that well, you know, Arius was kind of a deacon right like he had a thursday mm -hmm. he compared it to he had a thursday night bible study and then he turned himself into an expert <laughs> so part of it was well, they were trying to contain this guy that was getting really powerful i don't know I if that's, say that's a little bit of an unfair read of Arius, especially given that uh, a lot of modern religious figures are that no offense <laughs> <laughs> sure <laughs> and the other thing is that Arius well, wasn't the only one who was thinking that he was backed up by bishops who backed up his position. Right, right. right. Um, most famously, probably it would be so. There's a couple of Eusebiuses. Um, so there's Eusebius of Caesarea, and then there's also oh God. Where's the other one from? There's other Eusebius. He ends up baptizing Constantine in the end, but he was a known Arian sympathizer who later flip flopped and uh, bapt ended up baptizing him for Constantine's life. So like Nicomedia. There we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um you know when we talk about these things like wanting to bring it all the way down to Arius is actually a little bit unfair given that there is a serious Arian side that was comprised of plenty of bishops so if you think that being a bishop is makes you the boss of theology like that was not the nobody like had certainty that was like all that authoritative at this conference and also frankly if you spend a bunch of time reading the new testament it is deeply unclear where they got any of this stuff right right yeah, <laughs> like i mean yeah. I don't know, like I teach New Testament every summer and I have never found any obvious solution to these issues uh, by reading it. So, right, right, right. right. 
We've yeah. talked about um, Arius on the show before a little bit, and 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 uh, and Arianism, and I always feel like I need to to let our listeners know, for those of us maybe who aren't familiar with the, with the conversation, that um, we talk about Arius and Arianism. This is referring to a theological uh, movement in the early church, and uh, and is is unrelated except by unfortunate um, phonetics. Uh, to uh, to the Arianism we talk about with white supremacy and things yes. like that. that, is, that oh, is, yes, this is to Arius, A R I U S. Right, right. I, so just for our listeners who yeah, may yeah, be yeah, unfamiliar yeah. with those terms, this is a completely different thing. Uh, it's from from early church, and yeah, yeah. It's just so, a coincidence. Um, yeah, yeah, Good yeah. Point, it just yeah. sounds the same. Like um, I can't think of an example. So anyway, we'll move on. Um, <laughs> Liz, I was wondering, you you suggested some great questions ahead of time, and one of them was uh, raising the question of of ethical implications of solo gaming and whether the ethics of solo gaming is different from the ethics of multiplayer gaming. and <laughs> And I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on that because it got me thinking about some stuff too that I'm eager to jump in about. But what are your what came to mind when you when you discussed that when you brought that up? Actually, it's probably because I've been playing video games a lot. I've been playing Baldur's Gate uh, oh, yeah. 3, which is I see a lot absolutely about that. fantastic. Is it good? Uh, if you're out there and you don't mind some nudity in your video games, you should huh. play Baldur's Gate 3. It's very good. Uh, but um, I'm definitely going on Baldur's Gate 3, and I'm doing a bunch of different romances, and you have to decide if you're going to be nice or mean to people, and you got these different mm -hmm. dialogue choices. And so I like to save and then try different outcomes and then just laugh <laughs> at what happens. But it's very chaotic. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but um, on the table, there's also something to that, right? Because, you know, there are people who are much more aggressive with other humans. They're aggressive players. I'm actually, like, fairly nice to other people. I have a hard time being mean in board games that involve other people. Mm -hmm. But in a solo game against a, a an opponent that's not alive and can't get mad, I'm, like, ruthless, just mean. Like, I will absolutely do horrible attacky things and things that, like, I might think twice about, right, against another yeah. person. And I always find it really interesting because you know, back to enjoying your own company, right? I think that the true mark of who you are as a person is like just how far you'll go when you're by yourself. Mm, mm. And I think that games are a very interesting test of that because it's mm. like, oh, what would I do if no one was watching? Mm -hmm. And I feel like mm -hmm. part of it is fantasy, right? Like I love to play like horrible, like little rogues and like run around stealing stuff and like just being ridiculous in like fantasy video games. And obviously I would never do that in real life alone or with other people. But I also think that solo gaming opens up the possibility to know that about yourself because like, you know, how comfortable is this for me? Is this something that I actually want to live out or am I doing this for a laugh? Like I really, I find that solo gaming offers me a lot of opportunities to kind of examine like how I feel about different types of actions in a way that even playing Dungeons and Dragons with other people, you know, might not, they would, it might not give that perspective. Yeah, yeah. And I think that when you're playing historical games, it also opens up lots of possibilities. So, for example, I personally get skeeved out by playing um, Nazis. I don't like it. A lot of people feel that way in historical games. There are plenty mm -hmm. of people who have no problem with it and will very vociferously enjoy telling you so on your YouTube videos. Uh, my real big my real big kind of skeeve out is I really hate playing um, the Confederacy. I really don't like it. Mm -hmm. um, it is gross to me. So that's not true for everybody's experience, but you know, there are definitely certain like roles I don't like to take in games. So solo gaming is interesting because it allows me to either play against that side without asking a human to take that role, or it allows me to take on a role that I don't necessarily like very much, but I have to sit with it mm. because I'm by myself and I can sit with it and like examine how it is that I'm feeling. So, you know, one of the games I reviewed pretty recently was in Magnificent Style, Pick His Charge. It's a Herman Lemon game. And I just said outright, like, some people are like, why did you review it if you didn't think you'd like it? Uh, well, I don't actually think that's a criterion for why you would review things or not. Right, but... <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but um, I really got a lot, even though I didn't ultimately keep the game or feel that the game itself, the gameplay is super fun. So I'm probably going to crowbar. It's the same system, but it's D-Day. Much better. But um, I, uh, it was interesting to play it and try to win while doing a part of a battle where I was playing people that I did not want to win ever. Uh, and also, you know, helping them participate in one of what I think is a really stupid military move, but some people kind of see as like a big moment of glory in the history of the old South. And so it was really interesting to play the game and have to play enough times to be able to really review it. 
because I had to sit with who I was being in that game. And there was no one to kind of be like, you're fine. You have to do it yourself because you're playing alone. And so I thought it was a very productive experience, even though I, you know, ultimately said, yeah, this is an awesome game. If you can stand it, I can't. Um, <laughs> uh, right, but I right. think that solo gaming offers you a lot of meditative space for that, which mm, I right. really appreciate. Mm. Mm -hmm. It strikes me how much your discussion of solo gaming uh, kind of returns to these themes of uh, solo gaming kind of as a way of getting to know oneself better. I mean, just that it kind of, kind of self-discovery in a way. And, and, and both in terms of, um, as you're saying at the beginning of the episode, you know, feeling kind of agency and I can do this and I don't have to, you know, but also in terms of like, how far am I willing to go on something, you know, and what am I, that's uh, it. Meditation is a, a meditative practice is a really cool way to describe that. That's uh, I like that. I like that. Mm -hmm. I think you're the question when you suggested it really resonated with me because I, I'm also that way, Liz, that I, I am um, when I'm playing with another person, I, I Kevin, and I've talked about this and Kevin, I want to hear your thoughts on this because I, I think, I think um, it's something you've, you've think about as well. Um, when I'm playing with another person, I, I generally feel really guilty if I do anything bad, to them. <laughs> you know, I like, that's kind of why I like euros so much. I like yours. Cause I can just, I can just work here on my spreadsheet while you're working on your spreadsheet and we're, you know, and we're, we're fine at the end of it. Um, and I feel, you know, and I, but I feel like, Oh, if I tear something down that you've worked out, Oh, um, but if I, if I do a solo game, I don't feel any guilt about just, I just going hard on, yeah, on you know, the AI good. bot, you know, just keep hitting it again and again and again. And it doesn't even feel like I'm hitting it. It just feels like I'm doing this machine to generate points, you know, or something kind of. And, um, so I don't, so anyway, that really resonated with me. Kevin, any thoughts from you on, no, on it's any really of these cool issues? To, to formalize that idea that, that there's something about not having a person at the table to worry about or, yeah, like you can just focus on the game and also what it's doing to you is, is really powerful. It reminds me of a, there's a Buddhist story. And I don't have any sources or anything, but maybe I'll recognize it or maybe I just made it up. I don't know. But there's something about if a canoe runs into your canoe and no one else is in the other canoe, you don't get angry. It's like, well, this canoe just, if y'all, do y'all know this one? No, that canoe just no. floated no. in the mine. But if someone else was in the other canoe and ran into your canoe, you're like, oh, you idiot, I hate you. I'm going to kill your <laughs> pets, right? Um, and so what's the difference? It was just the presence of the other person that makes it, all of a sudden, makes you so angry and vengeful. Ah, and, and interesting. Solo games interesting. are kind of like that. Like, yeah, yeah, if the bot beats you, you're just like, well, I guess I should have played better. Or maybe the designer was too mean. I don't know. Um, oh, yeah, solo you, designers are supposed to be mean. You're not supposed to win solo games. What are you talking about? Probably, you're probably <laughs> right. You're probably right. I have learned from solo games. I'm really not a good strategist with board games, and it's made me get better. Because I tend mm. to want to do the action that's cool, not the action that's going to win. And especially against a solo bot, there is no mercy. Like, every move has to be getting you closer to winning. Uh, so... Yeah, Ke it, it, it's a it's a more conniving experience, which I appreciate. Ke Kevin, uh, Kevin and I have been talking offline about this book, um, Games Art as Agency, um, C. T. Nguyen, uh, and um, and his whole thing is games are a way of exploring agency and just kind of and, and taking agency to kind of an art uh, a level of art, you know, and just uh, and uh, and it strikes me that's really what solo games are especially good at that. That it, it's all about growing in this in this ability in this agency whatever whatever the game opens up for you um just again and again and again as you as you grow that skill and grow that that ability um mm -hmm. yeah yeah agency is That's i guess cool. different modalities of acting is that that's yeah. what he's talking about like different i think i think that's right styles I, of of yeah unless it's the fbi Maybe that's right. is that what, is that what it means or intelligence. <laughs> no, that's right. Liz, yeah. Have you tried or you're going to try the American presidency, which is talked about as an eight hour solo extravaganza? Yes, I do have it. I am waiting for my moments. Basically, uh, I'm planning to do it. I just have a bunch of stuff that keeps like flying in the door. Um, but I definitely need to play. I want to record a podcast episode with some people about this actually later in the season, because kind of what I want to talk about is did this game earn its weight? 
and earn its length and mm. you know how do i feel about chunky games in general like you know i think that there's a lot of interesting conversations to be had about um whether things are heavy for the sake of being heavy or whether mm. they are purposefully the way they are and you can't actually make any cuts um, i'm very interested in mm. gaming and what complexity really means and like how to deal with bloat like i find all of that stuff right. like worth talking about um you know i love heavy games but heavy doesn't necessarily mean long and i don't think it necessarily means complicated in exactly the way that you think so like pax renaissance is considered a heavy game and so think what you will about phil eckland you know i have my own issues with his viewpoints on many issues i mean the guy's a brilliant game designer and pax renaissance is a very interesting game um but the way it works you know it's a heavy game but you can also play it on a normal game night because it doesn't take that long to play it's that mechanisms take time to learn and seeing their their interconnectivity takes time hmm. whereas you know that doesn't mean like oh i need to spend five hours reading the rules it means oh this is that hard to play but oh man i missed that connection i'm an right. idiot like <laughs> this this breaks that yeah and there are other games that sprawl for the sake of sprawl which sometimes i like because what you want to do is get in a state of flow right you just want to kind of lose track of time for several hours and sometimes those games that are very soothing even like say a blackjack type game assuming you're not out of money like you can just yeah. sort of pass the time in a really soothing way it's like working a puzzle almost so yeah i, I appreciate bloat as long as i know what i'm getting into or someone else isn't getting frustrated indeed hang on i'm gonna yeah. kick kato out kato before he kills himself. Kato. Better not want that game, little beast. Welcome here. Is one of the pagans that Dante puts in heaven. Or in really? purgatory. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Because he kills You've himself. You've become a Dante Julius... expert. Yeah, I keep, I keep, want, I keep, well, I'm having to with this sermon series. And then I keep kind of, um, yeah, he's just a really interesting dude. What is the sermon series? Sorry about that. I'm Can't using the Inferno. Nice, nice. No problem, no problem. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, as a fan of historical games, and uh, as someone who's thought a lot about heavy games versus light games, and you know, do you earn your do you earn your weight as a game? Is it possible to have a good historical game that's also a light game? I certainly hope so, because David Thompson and I have been endeavoring to design one. <laughs> nice, nice, great, great. I be, well, then it must be possible, for sure, for sure. That's great, that's great. Any any uh, Anything that you feel comfortable saying about it now, or is that... Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah we've been yeah. open about the whole process. Um, so David and I are working on a game called Night Witches. It is about Soviet female night bombers of World War II. Oh, yeah. So yeah. you basically just fly harassment missions against the Germans all night, every night. Yeah. They did it for I years like and years. I like the theme. That sounds great. I've heard yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, we signed it with Fort Circle. Um, we're basically about to enter playtesting. Uh, the game is designed, but needs, you know, the tightening that comes with getting a bunch of playtesters to look at it. Got to make sure the rule book is good and all kind of stuff. Uh, we talked to an artist, but I can't name them publicly yet. But no. I'm very happy. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> and so, uh, nice. yeah, I mean, it's my first game design. It's actually been really wonderful. That's awesome. Yeah, a game designer too. Yeah, congratulations. Impressed. That's wonderful. Do, do you know publication time yet, date, or any of that, or... It'll probably no, hit Kickstarter no. sometime next year. Cool. In 2024. Well, we, yeah. We will that look for so it. And, and, and is the name Night Witches or what's the, does, yeah. you have it's a name It's on Board yet? Game Geek as Night Witches. Oh, I have to look it up. Cool. Very nice. <laughs> Very nice. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it's actually, that's yeah. been a really interesting process because um, co-designing something with someone, you know, David Thompson and I were already friends before, but you know, when you decide that you're going to embark on something like that together, it's like, okay, are we going to be better friends or are we going to hate each other after this? I have right. great news, which is that we get along better than ever. Um, that's great. It's actually been a wonderful process, but David's mm -hmm. a really good communicator. And, you know, if you don't know who David is, everybody out there, David Thompson has done a lot of different games. So like Undaunted and War Chest and nice, House nice. House and Castle Itter. Oh, Pavlov's House. That's a great yeah. one. I have that one. That's a great solo game. Yeah. yeah so Dave is my okay. co-designer for Night Witches. It's one or two That's player awesome. co-op. And, um, you know, he's got a lot more experience than me. This is my first game, but we managed to have a really 
good and healthy partnership despite that and so mm -hmm. now we have this game that's like a really weird mix of his and my sensibilities it's like if you just took parts of our brains and just splat like <laughs> you would have that's night which is <laughs> that's and great it's, it's been really a fun process we we'll have that's to look, we look forward to that that sounds that's great that's great congratulations yep. oh. so well, do liz, you think history can be represented in the game liz yeah sounds absolutely. like yes oh yeah absolutely um and you know it depends on what you want to represent like you can't ever capture the whole thing right but history in games has lots of very interesting expressions so you can see something very weird and finicky like republic of rome from old avalon hill there are certainly aspects of the Roman Empire it doesn't get across, but there are aspects that just feel spot on. And it's oh, really, really cool. fascinating to play. Or like um, Cole Worley is a fantastic mm -hmm. game designer. Um, he is responsible for amazing historical games like Pax Pamir or John Company, like the second editions of both. They've been updated from his earliest ventures. But um, I would say those are fascinating because it's like reading a historical, um, it's like almost like a dissertation but it's in the form of a game. Like wow. you're looking at how people interact and what's happening in this time period. And it's represented in game form, but I find it very mm. informative for these different time periods. I think I learned a lot from playing his stuff. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can choose to do history in a game. And, you know, that people are doing it. It's uh, actually one of the best games I've played this year. Probably Land in Freedom by Alex Knight. It's absolutely fantastic. It is. It has a solo mode. It's fine. What you want to do is play it with three players and do it semi-co-op because that's really the game as it's meant to be. Mm -hmm. uh, but Land and Freedom is about the Spanish Civil War. So basically it's like before fascism takes over, the anarchists, the communists, and the moderates are all trying to work together to be the fascists, but also trying to come out on top when they theoretically win. And so you're trying to both hold off fascism and get yours and get an edge on everybody else and the decisions the game forces you to make are so messy and it's very hard to win because people will betray each other and like choose to do things for themselves instead of for the whole of the country uh, and it is delightful <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like an awesome experience wow i didn't know that one land and yeah, freedom yeah panther published it so it's like a it's like a print on demand it's not as stinky as Blue Panther games used to be, um, but like you know, it's you don't get it for the Stonemaier games like production values. You get it because it's a great game. <laughs> right, right. Ke Kevin's a huge Cole Worley fan as well. That you you spoke his language there when you yeah, were yeah yeah I'm a big yeah. fan. Yeah, I agree. He does really interesting stuff that teaches you something which you, first you're not aware of it, and then later you're like, you think about it the next year, you're like, I think I know what he was trying to say. Maybe like it kind of haunts haunts me yeah. some of the stuff. Um, so yeah, that is cool. That is awesome. Um, well, yeah, Liz, I wanted to ask about also, um, you had shared earlier, uh, you know, we've, we've had guests on the show from a variety of faith traditions. We've talked about kind of those faith traditions shape their, their experience of games. We've had a variety of Christian backgrounds and, and, um, and, uh, Muslim perspective, Jewish, uh, Buddhist, and you mentioned earlier uh, you're an atheist. Would you would you mind just sharing how has that shaped your experience of of gaming? Uh, and and yeah, I'd be interested to hear how you kind of see see those two parts of yourself coming together. Yeah, just I'm please. Am I the first atheist that's been on the show? I think so. At least that admitted right. it. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. What do you think? I would Kevin? be the one to single handedly <laughs> drag everyone. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you're uh, good. No. You're good. Atheists tend to be very non-evangelical, actually. I think it's really weird if you don't think that there's anything to be that concerned about what other people think. But um, <laughs> uh, I'm interested in other people's experiences, but I'm not interested in directing those experiences, if that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's um, a wise statement, yeah. Yeah, that is, it is, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but um, I would say that gaming is actually a really interesting space to be in because it feels like a lot of the very dominating forces of the in gaming um, actually come from Christian communities and Christian spaces, like most notably Tom Vassell of the Dice Tower. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've worked at the Dice Tower in the past. Tom and I have a perfectly respectful relationship. We've never had a serious conversation about religion. That may be for the best, but like he knew what I was when he brought me on board and didn't mind. So, <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, and that's also actually true for the school where I uh, routinely teach New Testament in the summers. Like they know exactly what they're getting with me. I'm actually a fantastic New Testament teacher, believe it or not. Um, I bet, I bet. 
But uh, you can actually completely trust me to teach your children about the New Testament and they come out just fine. Um, <laughs> whatever background they came in with uh, or wherever they're going, just help them on their journey. They're, they're good to go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, for gaming, actually, I think that this ties into actually how we talk about gaming and play. Because one of the most interesting things, I got solitaire before it was a YouTube channel, was a blog. I just started a blog. 2016 and was like blogging about games and i still write on my site sometimes but i actually really like to make videos who knew like i feel really comfortable like talking out how i feel about stuff yeah um but i you know my views jumped and i was like hey somebody's reading my blog that's cool and like the school nurse was visiting when i checked the stats and i mentioned it and she's like liz why don't you write about something important mm -hmm. and i thought that was such a really interesting thing to say because mm -hmm. to me games are quite important uh but also you know, what makes something important? It's a yeah. really good question. Yeah. Um, you know, unlike maybe many people on the show who would place a certain tradition or document or perceived, you know, supernatural being at the center of their purpose as like a driving force for their life. I really don't have that. I don't see the world as particularly purpose driven. I think that purpose is something that we make and that you have to decide and that you have to live with what you've decided because you mm -hmm. only have a limited amount of time and you have to do the best that you can with what you've got. And so my goal of my life is to make sure that by the time I get to the end of it, because and you never know what's going to end. Um, that's it's an unpredictable thing, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that I feel good about how I spend my time. And for the most part, I really do feel that way. Like, you know, one of the reasons I became a teacher is because I feel like it's a good way to spend a person's time. Like, at least I know that when I go to work, my work is not 100% vanities, right? Like it's, you know, I'm going and doing something that matters to somebody in some way. And like, even if you can't see the results of your teaching right away, and very often you don't, the kids just kind of take whatever you gave them and just leave with it. And you don't even know if they took it, they might've left it on the floor with the hand up they left behind. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes you hear from your students who have gotten older and you realize that maybe you did mean something, right? Mm -hmm. Or you'll hear from a parent who says, oh, my child talks about your class all the time. And like, I would never know that, right? And so I have to live, right, with this uncertainty of whether what I'm doing matters all the time. Um, but I am able to tell myself that it does because I get enough indicators. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I also think that some of the most Excuse important me. things in our lives are things that have no obvious meaning. Like, for example, um, you know, we've been talking about art a lot in the board game community, right? Or literature. You know, the experiences that you have of other people's minds or the things that you can learn. I mean, if you're going to die and it all goes up in smoke, I mean, does it really matter? I would still say yes, because I feel that my life is enriched by mentally communing with others through the things that they make and through, also through experiencing those things with other people that I know in real life. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the reasons I like being a classicist is that, you know, knowing Latin and knowing Greek really gives you a lot of access to very interesting thoughts from the ancient world. And like, it's really funny, right. you know, those people don't really feel dead to you if you spend enough time reading them. Like I talk, I forget that people aren't there sometimes. Uh, uh. <laughs> but one of my favorite um, short texts to read with my seniors who are in upper level Latin is uh, excerpts from Seneca's uh, On the Shortness of Life. He's an interesting guy. You know, he was a stoic philosopher who really professed all these great ideas, but then ended up getting very political, becoming Nero's tutor, really trying to influence him, and then ultimately being forced to uh, kill himself by Nero. Mm. So, you know, um, he's the ultimate philosopher who got lured in by worldly things and then <laughs> didn't go very well. Um, <laughs> but on the shortness of life is great because he writes about, he claims, and I don't know if I agree with this, I feel like I've got so much life in me, I just don't know that I'll ever have enough time. But um, he says that life is long if you know how to use it and that the biggest resource that we waste, and this I do think is true, is time. Yeah. That time is a non-renewable resource and you don't know how much you have. And yet we just give it so readily to things that don't matter. Mm. And so I think a lot because I really do think my time is very finite <laughs> about what I'm going to give that time to. Yeah, and so yeah. why do I give so much of it to games? I would say the same reason that I spend a lot of my time reading. Um, I think that, you know, if you have the, the only person that's going to be with you when you die is you, really. So like, first of all, I do think you have to like your own company. This is why I have, do think about this very often. But I also think that you should spend your life on at least like things that are beautiful, things that other people have left behind who've gone on the same journey you're going on, which is just being alive on the planet. And also thinking about what you'll leave behind. Like, 
you know, one of the reasons I have changed a lot of my board game coverage is I used to just do straight reviews and I do do those and I do like tutorials, but the thing that I value the most is actually my podcast because I feel like the conversations that I have on my podcast are pushing for something a little bit bigger than was this game fun. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. my hope obviously, right, is that those kinds of conversations will be useful to someone when the new hotness is gone and when new games have come out and we forgot the old games, that there'll be something in those conversations that's like worth something to somebody in yeah. five years, in 10 mm -hmm. years, in 15 years, or like when there is no Liz anymore, but maybe YouTube will still be around. Like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I, I, I think a lot about that and, you know, I think a lot about grad school, my, um, my grad advisor, he and I had a troubled relationship. We made our peace, thankfully. Um, but you know, we had a, a tough time when I was in school. Um, uh, but his best advice was be useful. He talked a lot about how the scholarship that you publish in your life will be just kind of trampled on by future people who want to disagree with you and say you're wrong. And this is the new hot thing and the new hot way of seeing stuff. And he's right. You know, if you read back like New Testament scholarship is a wonderful example of this, right? If you like read through the history of it, um, the way things have changed over even the past like three centuries is stunning. Uh, but you know, the things that last the longest are the things that are the most useful. And so I think a lot about making myself useful, making things that like mean something to somebody else because then you are more likely to get like ping back that what you did meant something and mm -hmm. i find a lot of comfort in that like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe it'll all ultimately be meaningless and, like the sun will explode and the earth will be gone but i mean i'm not gonna be here for that so i'm gonna make the most of what i've got here <laughs> yeah 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 i like it thank you thank you yeah yeah i like that that sense of intentionality about making the most use of this limited resource of time that we have and 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 seeing games as a worthwhile way to spend that time because of the beauty because of the connection because of the folks who've come before us who've left it behind in a world often when they're not not seen as that worthwhile yeah that's thank you that's great yeah yeah we all we all crave rich experiences <laughs> because as you said time is limited and and that that depends on the person what's a rich experience but uh, yeah, games for for people that have that itch, games are very rewarding. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's so sad that we socially want to discount play. Like, mm -hmm. why is being serious so much more grown up and so much more important? Like, even like when I became a man, I put away childish things. Like, what exactly do you mean by that, buddy? Like, um, right? <laughs> because you know, what does it mean to be childish versus what does it mean to be playful? Like, I think that we are too tempted, especially, you know in the course of like the, in a life where you know in our society we're very much encouraged to be a workaholic be productive you know you need to be productive and you need to make money like all those things that you're supposed to do like why are we discounting play and why are we discounting you know the things that actually make your life rich when you could be doing you know, like <laughs> like what you know, are you doing that's worth yeah, you know that really <laughs> mm -hmm. So that that's something that hit me recently. Um, the, the value of play is something we talk a lot about on on this podcast, and just you know, and and the kind of and the the theological weight of that, and 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 yeah, and you're exactly right. I mean, we we discount that, and and that that passage, that passage, First Corinthians thirteen, right, where where Paul says that, right, you know, says when I became a child, I when I became a man, I put away childish things, and and I, you know, and I which which we read at every wedding and everything like that. It, it hit me the other day. For the first time, when I was reading through that, I, I've always read that as a passage of him saying, well, now I need to be grown up, you know, and, and now I need to. But I'm not sure. After all this talk about the theology of play and the value of play, I'm not sure but that he wasn't saying that as a regret. <laughs> or at least I, it hit me as a regret <laughs> as I was reading it. I mean, maybe, that maybe he was saying, um, I'm not, I'm not sure why I, why I had to put away that child of stuff. Like I, maybe kind of as a regret. Anyway, I don't know, but I, Funny, I'm with you. I were with you. I always, yeah. I always thought of that passage as more about a step being about maturity, which doesn't mm -hmm. mean you don't have play. It just means you're, he's not as immature as he used to be about, hey, that's my red ball type thing. Like oh, a child. yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Not so much. That's interesting. Yeah. I don't know what, I don't know what the commentators say. That's a good point. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Like, Thank what does you. it mean Thank to be you. childish? It's a good question, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, first of all, I 100% teach my children in Latin class about uh, farts 
in Latin and the Roman mm-hmm. toilets and the sponge on a stick. I mean, because it's funny. That's <laughs> awesome. No, it's, everyone yeah, wants yeah, to know. Yeah. No one wants to ask. That's great. Yeah, I'm yeah. wildly ch- childish in that way, but yeah. I'm not yeah. sorry about it. And I don't yeah. ever intend to put it aside. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I know we're approaching our, our end here. Uh, I, I could could we get a favorite, a recommended solo game? I could could we could we each do one or give us three like Ezra Klein show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are three? <laughs> three three books thoughts on that would recommend three solo books, solo solo. So my very baseline recommendation is always if you have a cooperative game at your house or a game with a solo mode that you already like and that you already bought, check if the solo mode is good. Uh, on BGG or something, and then try it because what you already like is more likely to give you a good solo experience. That's a great. Yeah. But beyond that, a lot of it depends on the kind of gamer you are. Like, if you want to try historical gaming, then maybe you, if you're, if you want to try something that's like super get your feet wet gently, you might want to try something like Resist, which was done by David Thompson, Trevor Benjamin, and Roger Tinkersley. Um, you could do, you know, if you want something light, if you want a light kind of worker placement that's historically. Uh, based, you could do something like McKee, which is like a very tense, tiny little worker placement that was um, originally like a print play, I think. It was published by Side Room Games. It's also a nice app. Mikey? Uh, if you wanted Maquis, M-A-Q-U-I-S. Mikey, M A Q U I S. Okay, cool. It's a French resistance game. Nice. Um, if you want something really chunky and fantasy, I mean, so Mage Knight is my favorite solo game of all time. It's been replaced really? by Spirit Island, but Mage Knight's a pain in the butt to learn. And if you want to commit to something, I think that Mage Knight's a great commitment. If you want something that's kind of in the middle, and maybe think you can also play co-op, um, and, but on the chunky end, you're going to want something... Like, I would say Too Many Bones is a big commitment, but it's nicer to co-op than something like Mage Knight. Uh, Mage Knight really should only be played solo because it's so chunky. Um, <laughs> uh, if you want to play Roman games, I love Stilico, Last of the Romans. It's like a States of Siege game where you've got these cards and you're trying to fend off invasions and pretender emperors as Stilico while somebody's also plotting against you in Rome you know Stilico had a barbarian quote unquote like background but he you know was really a great general for uh, a young emperor until he got you know um, executed for reasons unknown I don't think he actually did anything I think he just lost politically um, mm. <laughs> um, wow, wow. you know if you want to try something that's just historically fascinating you should try Pax Premier. Um, so Cole Worley did that design, but Ricky uh, Royal did a brilliant solo mode named yeah. Wakan. She's like a brutal opponent in Ricky that game. Ricky Royal taught me how to play Mage Knight because, as you said, it's very hard to learn, and the the uh, manual is kind of it's all there. It's just kind of bizarre. I don't know how to put it. Like it, it doesn't leave it out. It's just hard to find anything. And Ricky Royal's videos taught me Mage Knight. Yeah. Yeah, and he did the John Company solo, which is a really good solo too, I think. He's fabulous. Yeah. And honestly, I actually think that one of the best things to do is just go on Facebook and join solo board gamers or board games for one, BG for one, whichever one you want to do. Um, because people just post about what they're playing and it really gives you a good sense of what is fun and what people are communally enjoying. Uh, if you want to do things on the war and historical game end, then Solitaire War Gamers, I think is the name, or it's just or Solitaire War Games is the Facebook group for that. I often find that looking at what other people are playing and deciding whether I'm jealous of them and want to play it myself is a good indicator. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. That looks so fun. Uh, exactly. Um, yeah, whatever's giving jealousy. you FOMO might be a good place to start. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> it's a good measure. Well, what about you, Daniel? Um, so in anticipation of this, I don't really know how to, how to answer it. Cause I, 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 I play a lot of solo games, some that come with the, the game and some that are designed that way. And then some are just off of BGG. I'm just going to, I'm going to list, uh, my, my top three board games that I've played solo the most, I have the most plays, but they're really, this is not exciting, but that's because I can play these like in five or 10 minutes because I play at the end of the day all the, all the time. Orchard. The nine, the nine card. Oh, that's um, a cute one. Yeah, I've played. I I just play that. Orchard. At the end of a long day, um, I played that one a lot. Sprawlopolis, kind of in the same category, a little a little thing. And then this one wasn't designed as a solo game, but there's a solo mode on BGG that I've really fallen in love with, and I and I play this a lot as a solo game. Oh my goods, um, uh, Alex Fister, Alexander Fister, um, 
anyway, those those are my top three solo plays for me in terms of the gets the most plays for me. They're all very simple, small games. But I thought you liked Telestration solo. I can't <laughs> guess what I drew. <laughs> Telestration solo is amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. I have to. It's uh, called sketching. <laughs> yeah, I have to wait like a good six months between each turn because I forget that right, to allow time right. to forget what I drew the previous one. Um, but um, classic. Yeah. No, prob- probably my heaviest one uh, that I like to play. Tapestry has a solo mode that I like, and I, I played that one a lot. Uh, a solo. So, how about you, Kevin? Right. Right. Yeah, it's it's tough. Um, the one I really like is Wayfarers of the South Tigris. It's just got mm, a really, it, mm. it, the Garfield games always have really satisfying solo. And that's the one that, for whatever reason, I can remember the rules, I can get it out. It's kind of chunky, but it doesn't take forever. I love Mage Knight solo, but I, it's always a bit of I have to get reintroduced to it. So I'm going to play it once and screw it up. Then I, then I get into it, and it's kind of a long project. But that is, uh, Mage Knight is awesome. Um, so yeah, I'd probably, the, and then John company is fun solo and that's, that's a way I've learned the game. Um, so maybe those, yeah, those are good. Thank you all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just, I do want to plug, if you want to check out lists of solo games, the people's choice top 200 over on board game geek is like the hobbyist tops choices. They're great. Um, and then. Uh, this will come out after I've released. So Brant from Armchair Dragons and I uh, pulled specifically a historical slash wargaming community about their favorites. And so we've got a list out of like top historical and war games that are people's favorites. So if you just want to go see like what the public recommends, there's there's places for that now. Awesome. Awesome. And thank you. Liz, where can people find you? Speaking of those things, those those items are linked in your social media, I guess. You're connected to them. Oh, yeah. I'm ones, everywhere is Beyond Solitaire. Everywhere. Like Beyond any social Solitaire. media platform. Okay. Beyond Solitaire.net, Beyond Solitaire Podcast, Beyond Solitaire Gmail. I'm everywhere is Beyond Solitaire. I'm super easy to find. <laughs> Great. Right. <laughs> Brand consistency. <laughs> 101. Yep, that's great. And folks, thanks for listening. Anything else, Daniel? Check us out. I, board Game Faith. I don't th- yep, check us out on BoardGameFaith.com. You can reach us at BoardGameFaith at gmail.com. Um yeah, and we really appreciate everyone spending time with us. Um, thanks for taking some time out of your day. It is a, it's a, a gift and a joy, and, and Liz, especially, it's a gift and joy to get to spend time with you. Thank you so much for being a guest with us today. We, this has been great. Hey, it was yep. super fun to talk to you all. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>